Welcome to Unit 3. This is the point in our course where the art of the Western world really begins. And of course, that's too simple. Greece was very much a part of a Mediterranean world that included Egypt, and Egyptian art had a lot of influence over the Greeks, especially early on. But much of what I want to focus on today is what changes when we move north and west. When we talk about ancient Greece, we aren't just talking about the country that today we call Greece, the country I've circled here in red. Greek civilization was really born in Crete, the island I've circled in green. It moved to Mycenae, the pink circle, and the famous warrior civilization that gave us the stories of the Trojan horse and Odysseus. After a dark ages when things fell apart, Greek civilization burst back into life in Athens, yellow circle, and then spread to what is now the Italian island of Sicily, orange circle, and Ionia, blue circle, now western Turkey. Another warrior culture came from Macedonia, that's the purple circle. It conquered the Greek city-states and spread Greek civilization to the borders of India under Alexander the Great. Greek civilization would go on to flourish in Egypt and the Middle East before Rome took its place as ruler of the Mediterranean. The College Board has, for its usual mysterious and inscrutable reasons, eliminated what is often called proto-Greek art from the course. I can't bear to do that entirely, so I'm going to talk briefly about the art of two earlier Greek civilizations, the Minoan civilization of Crete and the Mycenaean civilization of the southern Greek Pel Peloponnesian Peninsula. What I want you to think about as you look at a series of images is how these proto-Greeks built on the art of cultures its seafaring peoples would have known and how they also departed from these traditions. So on the left, you see the goddess Neith from the tomb of Nefertari. On the right is the famous Minoan portrait nicknamed La Parisienne by the French archaeologist who found her. Note that these two paintings are only a hundred years apart, and that the Minoan painting is actually slightly older. But basically, they're from the same era. So what similarities do you see? Both works present a profile view with a frontal eye. Both present composite figures. The colors are bright on both. Indeed, the paintings in Nefertari's tomb, like the Cretan paintings, were true fresco. That means that the artist painted quickly on wet plaster so that the paint would fuse with the plaster and prove more durable. Finally, both paintings appear, both subjects appear to be wearing decorative clothing and probably jewelry. But what made a turn of the century French archaeologists think that this woman was somehow quintessentially European? Well, her hair is stylish, but it's more natural. You could imagine it actually blowing in the wind. She is animated. She even looks excited. This lady has got places to go and people to see. Here is a bull from the Palette of Narmer and the bull leaper fresco from Knossos. What traits do they share? Well, I would say that both bulls display power and virility. If anything, the Minoan bull is more stylized, less optical. But how are they different? Seems to me that the Minoan bull demonstrates greater movement and vitality, but what's really striking is the different interaction with humans. The Narmer bull probably represents the pharaoh, and it is pharaoh-like crushing an enemy. The bull leaper fresco celebrates humans overcoming bulls. The bull leaper's act represents a different kind of daring, of individual spirit, of athleticism. By the way, archaeologists are still arguing about whether these feats of daring were possible, but there are variants of bull leaping that survive to this day in Europe. Oh, I wish I had more time for Minoan art, which I love, but I'll just end with a couple of images that you saw in your readings. The Minoans produced exquisite nature frescoes, and Minoan frescoes are famous for their sense of movement and naturalism, although note that the plants are still somewhat stylized. Around 1400 BCE, the Mycenaeans burst out of their strongholds in southern Greece and overran Crete. More than 3,000 years later, we still enjoy the stories of the great Mycenaeans that Homer made famous, Achilles, Agamemnon, Odysseus, and Helen of Troy. We learn a lot about the Mycenaeans from these stories, which are now, we now know are at least partly based on real history. But what do we learn about this culture just by looking at its art? What you're seeing here is the famous lion gate of the fortress at Mycenae, the so-called warrior vase, and the so-called mask of Agamemnon, which was probably not actually his mask because it's too old to have been based on Homer's king. But what do these works suggest to you? How do they look different from the Minoan art we just saw? 
The Minoans built great palaces. The Mycenaeans built fortresses with thick stone walls. The Minoans decorated their palaces with paintings of pretty girls and buff young men leaping onto bulls. What appears on Mycenaean vases? Warriors. The mask, too, seems to be a warrior's mask, not that light-hearted spirit for the Mycenaeans. This was a culture that lived and died by the sword. But if the Mycenaeans are a warrior people, they are still a Greek warrior people. So let's compare this mask of Agamemnon with King Tut. How are these two works similar? Well, to be obvious, they're both made of gold, although the so-called mask of Agamemnon is hammered out of gold or repoussé, while Tut, from a richer civilization, is made of solider gold and contains precious stones as well. But materials aside, what similarities and differences do you see in these faces? Well, they're both death masks, but the Mycenaean king actually looks dead. He is clearly mortal. He is also, at least to my eye, more individual in appearance, although we really don't have any way of knowing if that's just as much of if he's just as much a physiological fake as Tut. So yes, there is a continuity between the ancient Near East and the Proto-Greeks, and yes, there is something new under the sun. At any rate, the civilized Greek world of the Minoans and Mycenaeans fell apart and was replaced by a dark ages that lasted around 400 years. Homer's great tales, the Iliad and the Odyssey, were written down during this period. So here we see a dark ages sculpture of contact between a man and a centaur, or man-beast. Do we learn anything about Greek heroic age values from the statue? Well, for one thing, the human figure is nude, except for the helmet, which in my mind rather emphasizes the nudity. This is new. Sculpture from the nearby Near East almost always portrayed its heroes clothed. The naked human body is much admired in Greece. In Greek Olympics, for example, the wrestlers wrestled in the nude. Did you notice anything about the size of the two figures? Well, surely a horse would be bigger than a man, but this is a hero maybe Heracles, so he is appropriately larger than the centaur. Again, the Greeks focus on human power, on man overcoming bull, hero overcoming centaur shows up in this work. The values honored in Homer's stories would continue to dominate Greek culture throughout the period you've studied. Values such as physical prowess, courage, protection of family and community, and personal honor. Greece emerged from its dark ages with the development of the city-state, or polis. Actually, the term originally referred to a citadel, an elevated, defensible hill such as the Acropolis in Athens. Later, these communities added an agora, or marketplace and civic center. This period, which is called Archaic Greece in your Greek in your textbook, also saw the expansion of Greece west of Sicily and east into Asia Minor, and the rise of Athens as both a commercial power and as a kind of fledgling democracy. But keep in mind that Athens was only one of many Greek pole, that's plural, polis, and it was initially not the most powerful. We're going to be looking at Greek temples and Greek sculpture in later lectures. I just wanted to put these together to give you a sense of the art of the Archaic period, which basically ended with the Greeks' enormous victory over Persia. Stay tuned for our next lesson. But before we get there, I want to talk about the Athenian Agora and the Niobides Crater and use these two works to begin grappling with the extraordinary intellectual and artistic flowering of ancient Greece. So this is the College Board Record image on the left, and it's remarkably unhelpful, which is why I put a labeled version into your workbook. The Agora has never shown up in AP exams before, and we AP teachers have been engaging in a lively online discussion about just what the College Board might expect you to know, and for that matter, why they included this image, which doesn't exactly seem like a work of art. To tackle the last question first, I think the wizards of the College Board probably want you to understand that Athens culture was shaped to an extraordinary extent by its commercial ties to the Mediterranean world and by its unusual form of government, a kind of participatory government which, while limited to male citizens, still reflected a rather extraordinary step in human history. The really famous art history buildings are up on the Acropolis, where the Athenians worshipped. The Agora is where they pursued their daily lives. This imaginative reconstruction is also in your workbook, and I'll just hit a few highlights. 
you should recognize the Panathenaic Way. I've marked it with a red arrowed line. This was the path that led from Athens' defensive Diplian Gate through the Agora to the Acropolis. Athens' main religious festival involved a procession of its citizens along this path, ending at the altar outside the temple to Athena, which was later replaced by the Parthenon. Stay tuned. What circled in green? This was one of the many stoa, or long colonnaded buildings that would contain shops, but were also the primary meeting place for Athenians. If you wanted to hang out with Socrates, this is where you would go. This is the reconstructed stoa of Attalos, which dates from the Hellenistic period after Alexander the Great. It now houses the Museum of the Agora. And in purple, we see the square building a bulletarian or senate building, and the round building, the tholos, a meeting place for 50 men who ran the affairs of Athens on a day-to-day -day basis. So, what did you learn from your reading about how Greek democracy worked? The Greeks did not have a representative government. Members of the senate were chosen by lot. In other words, any citizen could be called upon to serve in a leadership position in times of crisis. On the other hand, the Athenians chose specific leaders, with Pericles as the most famous example. The Agora was all about exchange, exchange of goods, exchange of ideas. This openness to discourse, to debate, and even to constructive disagreement really was something new in human history, and it reflected an extraordinary willingness to rely on human beings, mere mortals, to arrive at right decisions and to choose a new course. The Greeks asked a lot of their leaders, but it did not ask them to be gods. The wars with Persia would reaffirm the Athenian confidence in themselves. Again, stay tuned. The Athenian Acropolis had originally been Athens' defensive citadel. Later, it became the main center of worship. The image on the left is the College Board required map. The image on the right, also in your workbook, shows you what you're seeing. But really, we're getting ahead of our story. This is post-Persian Wars Acropolis. Here is the Acropolis in the Archaic period, before the Persian invasion that burnt down the old temple to Athena, circled in red, and the partly built new temple to Athena, circled in green. You don't need to know this version of the Acropolis, but you do need to understand something about the religious world and mindset of the Greeks. To enter that world, let's turn to our final work of the day, the Niobides Crater. In the past, I taught a number of Greek vases. In some ways, it is a great relief to focus on just one, but it ends up with a distorted view of this very Greek art form. So let's watch part of, watch part of a short video that talks about the two major kinds of Greek vase painting, black figure and red figure, and how they were executed. Note that your required work is red figure. So this isn't a required work, but since the artist chose to depict a scene from Homer's Iliad using both techniques, it gives you a sense of the two styles. The advantage of the red figure technique, where details were brushed in rather than incised, was that the artist could use much more detail and could also change the effect by varying the thickness of the glaze. Red figure technique was especially useful for portraying musculature, and the Greeks did love those buff bods. So I'm a little curious that the College Board chose this side of the work to make its required image, since art historians are still actively debating the content of this painting, the narrative that it tells. On this side of the vase, we see 11 figures placed at different levels. Only two of them are obviously recognizable. Heracles, in the center, is holding his club and bow, bow with his lion skin over his left arm. Athena is on the left. Around them are several warriors and represented in varying poses. But which Heracles story is this telling? Maybe Heracles is descending into Hades to rescue warriors who had tried to carry off Hades' wife, Persephone. Maybe Heracles, the son of Zeus and a mortal mother, has just been made a god. A more recent theory, so this is the theory that's probably more likely to show up on your test, is that this relates to the Persian Wars. We know from ancient sources that Her Heracles was thought to have helped lead the Greek soldiers to victory in the Battle of Marathon. So this may show the warriors of Marathon coming to place themselves under the protection of the hero before the battle. The other College Board image on the left really just hints at the story on the other side, which is why I've included a frontal image. I assume you watched the Khan Academy video. So what's going on here? I'm not going to repeat the somewhat gruesome story. Instead, I want to pose this question. What do we learn about Greek values and Greek religion from this story and from this art? What kind of gods did the Greeks have? They had gods that behaved and even more misbehaved, like people. Greek gods quarreled, 
played favorites and took sides in human conflicts and within their own family. Zeus was always off seducing mortal women, and most of the goddesses didn't behave much better. As disconcerting as we, or at least I, find the theology of Greek gods, it does, in a sense, reflect the central idea of Protagoras, that man is the measure of all things. Let me close with a few comments about form. The artist has abandoned the common ground line that we saw on the bilingual vase, and instead has portrayed the story on staggered tears. This parallels a move away from strict frontality in classical Greek sculpture, as we'll soon see. The figures display the stiffness of archaic and early classical sculpture. The more natural movement of contrapposto hasn't shown up in Greek art yet, but we do see the fascination with the human body and the way it moves. Another interesting feature of this crater is the depiction of landscape, admittedly a rather oddly shaped tree. We will talk about developments in Greek sculpture soon, but first I want to return to public spaces and talk about what their very different public spaces teach us about Greek and Persian culture.